Hi everyone, this is our channel, Meet the Real Story. Please, like, share and subscribe. I adore detective adventures and solving puzzles that others can't. I'm crazy about this. I love challenges and mysteries. I'm Ramon. But my father's nickname for me is Megamind. I'm 14 years old, and I'm typically ranked number one in my class every year. I have become famous for solving riddles. Many comers have tried to unseat me, but all have failed. I love to examine minute details. But let me get on with telling you my story. One hot summer, we had just finished our exams at school and were going on summer break. So I organized a trip to the beach with my friends. Beach weather is amazing. Clear skies, cool ocean breezes, sand, and sun. Just amazing. One day, before my beach trip, my mother handed me a letter from my grandmother. I was surprised and thought it was a little weird because Granny owned a hotel in the surrounding area nearby. It had wonderful views all around it. I had opened the letter, which read, Dear Ramon, How are you? I hope you're enjoying your summer break. Would you mind spending a couple of days with me? I have a serious matter that I would like to discuss with you. Granny. Initially, I thought that it was probably some silly matter, but then my inner voice told me that it might be important. I was conflicted between going on my beach trip or visiting my granny. I decided to visit granny first. She was family after all. So off I went. Though my grandmother lived in a beautiful area, the closer I got to the hotel, the more my inner voice was nagging me. When I arrived at the hotel, Granny was waiting for me. She smiled and hugged me. I had missed her so much. She had company. Raul, her maintenance man, and Malika, her housekeeper and assistant. There weren't any guests in the hotel at the time, and I asked her why. Her face changed, and she said that was what she wanted to speak to me about. So we went to her room to talk. She then proceeded to tell me that the hotel was haunted. Haunted? I exclaimed. What makes you think that? Granny said, The hotel has evil spirits that frighten the guests at night. I didn't want to believe it, but I knew Granny was a rational person. I suspected there was more to this than meets the eye, so I decided to investigate this intriguing mystery. On my first night at the hotel, I waited until midnight. Then I lit a candle and walked through the halls of the hotel. There were photos on the wall and I could hear whispering and the rustle of the leaves outside. It was a little spooky and unsettling and made my blood run cold. Suddenly, I heard laughing on both sides of the hotel and a shadow passed quickly in front of my eyes. Unnerved, I quickly returned to my room where soon afterwards I heard something scratching on my door. I kept thinking to myself, I am not afraid. I am not afraid. Then the door began opening slowly. I saw a hand on the doorknob. Then the owner of the hand came into view. It was a cloaked, headless man holding a candle. I fainted. The next day, I woke up to find Granny and Malika standing beside me. Granny told me that I had been sleeping a long time. I asked what had happened and they told me they heard me scream and came to my aid. When they found me, I was unconscious on the floor. At that moment, there was a knock on the door. It was Raul bringing me a drink. That was when I noticed something strange about Raul's face. It was emotionless. Then I glanced at his hands as I accepted the drink from him. That night, I again walked around the hotel. I found some steps at the end of a corridor that led to the basement. Down in the basement, I opened a maintenance door and found a tape recorder and a pile of clothes on a table. Suddenly the lights went out. I was groping around in the dark and trying to find my way back when I heard the laughing again. Still, I continued stumbling ahead through the dark. I stepped on an electrical line and tore it off the wall. I returned to my room. My door opened slowly. I was hiding behind the door. I grabbed the loose electrical detonator and touched it to the doorknob. It was live, and I heard a grunt from the owner of the hand on the other side of the door as he or she was shocked, and I heard him or her fall to the floor. It took me a while to find the electrical panel, but I managed to get the lights back on. When I did, 
I found Raoul laying unconscious on the floor next to the doorknob that I had electrified. I called Granny and Malika down to the basement. Granny asked what had happened. I replied, Granny, you really need to screen your employees better. Raoul was your ghost. Granny looked shocked and asked me what made me think that. I explained that the hand on my drink today was the same hand I saw on the headless ghost that opened my hotel room door the night before. I also found tools, a tape recorder, and some ghost clothes down here in the basement. In addition, I found the earphones that had been placed around the hotel. Granny was shocked. Raul woke up about that time, and she grilled Raul. Why are you scaring all my guests away, Raul? He said, This hotel used to belong to my family, but you bought it from my grandfather. Well, I wanted it back. Please forgive me. Malika said, We have to call the police. But I said, No, wait. I have an idea. Let's renovate and reopen the hotel with a new name. The Haunted Hotel. Our advertising slogan will be, Spend a night in a haunted hotel. Raul can do his ghost thing with the whispers and the laughing. Why, he can even flicker the lights off and on at a random time once or twice a night just to give the hotel a spooky atmosphere. The idea proved to be a big hit. The haunted hotel attracted many tourists and Granny's business prospered. I had a nice holiday and still managed to fit in my trip to the beach on my summer break. Most people I saw hated and cursed at me, and some treated me more kindly and gently than usual. It was very confusing to be honest. I didn't know the reason for people's animosity towards me, but I thought perhaps it had something to do with my mother. Before telling my story, let me introduce myself. My name is Maria. I lived in a poor neighborhood fraught with drugs and death. People who lived there were mostly losers growing up. People have always looked at me with disdain, for no good reason. People ostracized me. I had no friends, no one to speak to. When I would return home, I'd ask my mother why people didn't like me. She wouldn't answer. She'd just cry and smile sadly. She would often tell me to ignore people's looks. But how can I ignore the looks of everyone around me? It was the biggest mystery in my life. I didn't know if my father was alive or not. The only thing I knew about my father was how he looked from a picture on our wall. And if I asked about him, my mother would only tell me that he traveled and he never came back, that she didn't know anything about him, almost as if he were dead. But I suspected that she wasn't telling me the whole truth and I thought people in our neighborhood knew something I didn't. Perhaps that was the reason they hated me so much. Aside from this problem, I was a clever girl at school. I dreamed of having a good position in life to make my mother proud of me. One day, as I was returning home from school, I felt that someone was following me. I turned around once, but saw no one. The second time I turned around, I saw a man. He was wearing a mask. I was afraid, and I ran home to my mother. She was worried, and she just hugged me. It happened a lot after that. It seemed like everywhere I went, that man just happened to be there. I spent a lot of time thinking about it, who that man could be. Eventually, I graduated and got a job with a well-known company. We left our poor neighborhood and rented a flat in a good area. I had almost forgotten about the mystery man who used to follow me often. Then, one day, a poor man came into my office. He handed me an envelope, smiling. He told me to say hello to Isabella, then disappeared, leaving me with even more questions. Who was he, and how did he know my mother? I returned home, told her about this man, and showed her the envelope. She looked worried and asked me to quickly open it for her. When I did, I found something unexpected. One old photo of him, and a recent one. I didn't know it then, but that man was my father, and all I did was walk away. I curiously began reading the letter. It said, Dear Maria, I am sorry for everything. Sorry for the suffering I caused you and your mother. Sorry for not being there with you as you grew up. I hope that you can both forgive me. Please tell Isabella that I never forgot about her, or you. I love you two so much. I looked at my mother. She was holding the photographs and crying quietly. So the mystery man who had often followed me home had actually been my father, watching me from afar. I asked my mother, why did you hide the truth from me? Why didn't you tell me where my father was all these years? She replied, 
I was afraid to shock you with the news that your father was in prison for killing someone. And I gasped. Killing someone? Hi, I'm Gamila. Have you ever experienced a life problem? I know everyone has their own problems, but imagine you had to hide something all your life. Do you know what it feels like? If not, let me tell you. My name is Gamila. It means beautiful in Arabic, and I really am beautiful, or so I've been told. But I have a problem. I always wear a glove on my left hand anywhere I go because I'm too embarrassed to show it to anyone. This has become my life problem. You see, I've had seven fingers on my left hand since birth. My family couldn't afford a surgery to remove these extra two fingers. It would have cost a lot of money, and I would have had to travel abroad because we didn't have clever doctors or good hospitals in my area. So I've been wearing a glove on my left hand since I was young as a temporary solution for this problem. People always ask me about the glove, but I never answer. I just say that my fingers get cold. You would see me in the summer wearing a short, sleeveless blouse and a glove on my left hand. There were a lot of things I had to give up because of my hand. Once, I wanted to play gymnastics. My mom was okay with it, so I went to many places to train, but they all refused to accept me because of my seven-fingered hand, which they considered to be a problem. At school, my classmates would laugh and ridicule me a lot, so I never had a lot of friends. Just a few. I got into the college of my dreams. I thought that people might stop this bullying, so I considered taking off the glove. But I was afraid, because I was going to join a new society, so I didn't. I went with the glove instead. I was surprised at the amount of bullying at college, more than I had ever seen. It was a good thing that I decided to wear my glove. There were a lot of bullies there. Then, something happened. It became a turning point in my life. One time, while I was standing and speaking with my friends, one of them suddenly pulled off my glove. This glove was old and wasn't very tight on my hand. I had been intending to buy a new one after school. But they all discovered my secret. Some were astonished, while others started making fun of me and bullying me. I stopped going to university for a whole week. People blamed me for something that wasn't my fault. But that was the story of my life. If I hid away now, I'd be in this mess forever. So I decided never to wear that glove again. I decided to face my fears. I am beautiful enough to live a good life. I decided to ignore all the bullies and take care of myself. I went to my college. I didn't care about people's opinions. I focused on my studies, had great success, and proved to myself and to others that I was not disabled. The disabled can't think or succeed. Later, when I was attending a lecture by a famous doctor, he noticed my hand and offered to operate on it and make it look normal. This surgery would be the first of its kind in my country, and I accepted. When I saw my hand after the surgery, I couldn't believe myself. Bullying can ruin people's lives. But as they say, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. I don't really like Indian movies, because the actors are always overreacting, and the movies are not logical at all. But this is just my personal opinion. However, I've discovered that there are stories stranger than Indian movies. Let me give you a real-life example. I'll tell you a story about a young woman named Samantha. Samantha was a beautiful girl, with blonde hair and green eyes. She lived with her grandmother, after her parents died in a horrible car accident. The whole country read about it. She had many friends, and all the neighbors liked her. They considered her the most beautiful girl in town. Many had proposed to her, but she didn't care much for them. One day, Samantha was walking alone down the street after visiting one of her friends. Suddenly, she had an eerie feeling that someone was following her. She began running and crying for help. Her follower began running and stopped her. He was an ugly man, pointing a knife in her direction. He asked her to hand over her purse. She threw it at him and made a run for it. The man said wait and made to stop her, but another man appeared out of nowhere and punched the thief. Who fell unconscious. The brave and good Samaritan picked up Samantha's purse and handed it to her. He was very handsome, with green eyes, soft hair, and an amazing smile. He escorted her back home, and she felt that he was her knight in shining armor. She went inside and hugged her grandmother tight, who was a little surprised but smiled. Samantha was so happy that she gently pulled her grandmother to her feet 
and they whirled around and danced playfully. The very next day, she was surprised when she answered the doorbell. Steve, the tall, handsome man, was standing there, holding flowers. He proposed to her, and she said yes. Thus began their love story. Then one day, Samantha was standing in the kitchen preparing dinner. Steve and her grandmother were out, but they were supposed to be back soon. Samantha had everything ready, and she set the table. The house door opened, and Steve walked in. Samantha went to greet him, but she felt dizzy and fainted. Steve quickly took her to the hospital. The doctor congratulated Steve, saying that he was going to be a father. Steve was ecstatic, but Samantha was not. Instead, she was shocked and nervous. She said that she was too young to have kids, that she wasn't ready to be a mother. Steve was taken aback and said, But why? Don't you want him? Things were different from that point on. Samantha tried to get an abortion several times, but Steve was always stopping her. She couldn't accept it. She blamed Steve, but Steve couldn't understand her. In her seventh month of pregnancy, Samantha was with her grandmother at the supermarket when she saw a small boy run onto the road. Fearing he might get run over by a car, Samantha quickly pulled the boy off the road to safety. The boy's mother saw what happened and thanked Samantha, feeling so grateful and relieved. Samantha was crying at the moment and replied, No need to thank me. I'm going to be a mother like you soon. For the first time, she was beginning to feel real affection for the baby. Forgive me, she silently thought to herself. She tried to contact Steve many times to tell him that she had finally accepted. She was ready to become a mother, but he never responded. Finally, the day had come. Samantha went to the hospital to give birth. After the surgery, she was very tired. Nevertheless, when she woke up, she immediately asked for the baby. Her grandmother handed her the child. It was a daughter, and she was so beautiful. The nurse tried to take the baby out of her arms, but Samantha refused wanting to hold her for as long as she could. The next day, Samantha heard a big commotion, and she had a feeling of dread that something bad had just happened. It was confirmed when she saw her grandmother's face. She asked what had happened, and her grandmother told her that a child was missing and had apparently been kidnapped. Samantha's pale face slowly pleaded, Please don't tell me that it was my daughter. When her grandmother nodded, Samantha broke down and began crying and wailing in pain, the nurses tried to calm her down, and when she did, her grandmother came over to her and handed her a note. It had been found in her missing daughter's hospital crib. It was in Steve's handwriting. It simply said, If you don't want her, I do. Then Samantha fainted. For many years, she tried finding her baby, but couldn't. Steve and her daughter had vanished into thin air. She felt as if time had stopped for her, but Steve didn't feel that way. He raised their daughter into a beautiful young woman. He named her Margot. Whenever Margot asked about her mother, Steve would always tell her that her mother was dead. But he often told her stories about her mother and how much he had loved her. Margot's intuition, however, told her that her father wasn't being completely honest with her and that he was hiding some big dark secret. One day, Steve fell ill unexpectedly. He called Margot to him and told her that he was very sick and felt that he was going to die soon. He said that he wanted to reveal a secret that he had long kept from her, that her mother was actually alive, and that her name was Samantha. He told her that he had kidnapped her from the hospital at birth because her mother did not want a child. He regretted it and asked Margot to forgive him. He gave her Samantha's address, and soon after, he died. After his death, Margot decided to go looking for her mother. I am Margot and I am now standing at my mother's address, at her front door. I cannot predict my mother's reaction when she answers the door and I introduce myself as her daughter, but I'm going to hug her and tell her that I've missed her for so long.